he will lead the interaction discussion with us today. Please welcome Mr. Raymond Lopez. First, I would like to thank everyone for inviting me here. Uh, this practice has really meant a lot to me. Uh, my teacher, Tina Aquan, uh, has really helped me out a lot uh, throughout my life, uh, and also just in my general everyday practice. Um, before we get started, if everyone could please close their eyes for a minute. The first thing I want to tell you is that it's okay to be sad, and it's okay to have pain, and it's okay to be angry. And that the, the purpose of practice is not to eliminate any of these emotions. We're bringing awareness and compassion into these emotions. So we're not eliminating anger. What we do is we bring awareness into that anger. We bring compassion into that anger. And what happens is slowly over time, that relationship to anger changes. And the relationship to our suffering, to our sadness, and to our life changes. Uh, part of my work is that I work in a grief recovery center where we deal with people who have experienced traumatic loss, who have lost family members, uh, who have lost loved ones, lost their jobs, lost their homes. Uh, to, to give you an idea of what they're experiencing, if you would please for a minute imagine this situation. Imagine someone who has lost their arm, and not just any arm, but the arm that they use on an everyday basis to write, to do everything that they would normally do as their dominant arm. In that person's life, there are constant reminders of that loss. When they wake up in the morning and their alarm goes off and they go to reach for it and they remember, my arm is gone. When they go to brush their teeth, and they have to use the opposite arm. There's that reminder again, okay, this part of my life is missing. And so with this, with this individual, every aspect of their lives, there's a reminder of what's missing in their life. And many of us, you know, if, as we go through life and experience different things, we're gonna be reminded. So the main message I was trying to get in terms of happiness is that the purpose of practice is not to be happy in every single moment of our life. Because as emotions come into our life, they also go out of our life. So happiness, sadness, depression, all of those things, they're going to come and they're going to go. And that's where our practice really helps us with this. Because when we bring compassion and awareness into these emotions, it completely changes the relationship. To give you an example, Let's imagine for a second that you're sitting in your living room and all of a sudden anger kicks in your door, picks you up and says, okay, it is time for you to be angry. In our normal reaction to this, anger wins because anger is in control. Anger takes you, anger takes you and it says, okay, this is what we're going to do today and you're going to listen to me. When you bring that compassion and awareness into that situation, it changes. Because instead of reacting to anger that way, you shake anger's hand. You say, okay, anger, here I am. It's good to see you. Very nice to see you today. Would you like to have some tea? Would you like to sit down a little bit? Let's talk. Let's see what's going on. I'll be angry with you, but let's give it about 10 minutes. And then we'll go out and we'll cause havoc together. So once that relationship changes, what happens is, you know, anger will still kick in your door and he'll still say, all right, get up. It's time to get angry. Let's go do this. But what happens is once that relationship changes, you've shaken anger's hand a couple times. You've seen the anger face to face and said, okay, you're angry. It's fine. After a while, instead of kicking in your door, it's a knock. Now, of course, it's going to be a loud knock at first. It's going to be, let me in. I'm ready to get angry. Let's do this. And then anger's going to come in and beat down the door. But then what will happen is slowly over time, you and anger are going to have a relationship. You and anger, anger's going to come knock on your door and say, Mr. Lopez, 
I would like you to come with me and be angry, please, for a second. And we're going to go yell at this person. And because you and Angler have established this relationship, you can say, Anger, I do not want to do this right now. If you could please uh, come inside, we'll be angry for a second, but then I'm going to have to ask you to leave. You know, and it seems kind of strange uh, to talk about emotions that way, but one thing to keep in mind is that those emotions are always going to be in our life. You can practice for 20 years, you can practice for 30 years, you can practice for 40 years. Every so often I might see a monk that's angry and he'll only have 95% compassion for all living beings. <laughs> but even that will happen because as long as we live in the world and we're in this body, we're going to be experiencing these things. And, and from my experience, what meditation does is it changes our relationship with our understanding, it changes our relationship with our body and with our heart, and it changes our understanding of, of the universe in general. And, and once those things start to happen, those relationships start to change, you're no longer a hostage. So if you have a boss or an employer who just gets under your skin every single day and you have to go into that office and see them over and over again, after a while, that relationship with that person, when you practice that compassion, that understanding, that relationship with that person will transform. And it happens very slowly over time. I know, I know when I first started practicing, I would get very discouraged because I would sit and I would sit and I would practice. But no matter how much I practice, here would come all those old thoughts, all those old thoughts of depression or sadness. And just to give you a little bit of information about myself, I, I work as a counselor in, at LSU, um, and I do mainly academic counseling. Uh, so my main job there is to work with students in crisis. I worked in the first year of college for about three years, and, and during that time I would work with students who would come in, they may be failing grades, they may be struggling uh, with different social things. Some of them would have family members who would maybe be in bankruptcy, have to pull out of school. And, and what helped me the most in that, in that work environment, seeing people come in in crisis every day, was that compassion and that understanding that comes with meditation. So as they would come into my office, even if I was doing something else, I would try to bring my attention back to where they were. And remember, even if it was a story that sounds similar to someone else, so I would see a lot of people who may be failing a class, who may be losing all their job. Even if that situation was similar, remembering this is a unique experience. Nobody can duplicate this experience. And I think this is something that can be really brought into our meditation practice because each second of our existence is, is a unique experience. It may seem like the minute before, or the minute before, or the minute before, but those seconds, those seconds in between seconds, those things are real and they're part of our experience. A lot of times when I practice, I'll find myself starting to think about my day, and I'll think about the moment I wake up, and I'll think about brushing my teeth, and I'll think about getting out of bed, and. Uh, waking up with my two-year-old son and, and, and feeding him breakfast and all those things. And the more I practice, the more I realize that those moments in my day are just snapshots of my existence. There was a moment in between waking up, in between waking up and in between going to the bathroom. There was a moment in between picking up my toothbrush and brushing my teeth. And the, and the more I practice, the more I realize that our, our existence, our reality, who we are is, is slipping through our fingers every single day. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I, f I think formal practice is very important. Formal practice is like the, the, the center of the circle. You put the center in the circle, but once the circle is drawn, there's much more than just that point in the circle. So the, the, the practice of, of meditation, these, these retreats, every time you meet with your sangha and find that support, 
That is the center of your circle. It, it's putting the spot and saying, okay, draw the rest of your life around this. And the rest of your life is very simple moments. It could be being on the freeway, uh, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, and you start, you know, anger comes knocking on your door again. And even in that moment of, the, of being on the freeway, but I'm okay. <laughs> even, in that, uh, even in that moment, you can find some serenity in that. And it doesn't happen right away. If you practice meditation routinely, you will start to see those relationships change. Um, so I want to I talk about a couple things in terms of formal practice versus informal practice. Um, I think a great story in Buddhism that, that illustrates the importance of informal practice and formal practice is the story of Ananda. Um, as you know, Ananda was the Buddha's closest follower. And during the day, he would be around Buddha all the time, and he would listen to every story that the Buddha said, and he could remember every single story. He was always there attending the Buddha. He was putting forth all his effort in practice. But as much effort as he put in, and as many stories as he remembered, he didn't reach enlightenment. It wasn't until after the Buddha passed away, he was, he was practicing, trying to attain enlightenment so bad, and finally he's, he exhausted himself. And he went back, to, he was going back to sleep, and, and, and in that moment between when he fell asleep, or between when he was going to sleep and his head hitting the pillow, that's when he woke up. That's when his head hit the pillow. And, and to me, that story really illustrates a lot to me about, you know, uh, my, my, tr my attempts to try and be aware of things and, and try to love and, and care about people and work with my family is that, you know, we can put forth a tremendous amount of effort, a tremendous amount of effort in finding happiness. We can, pers we can have this idea of what our happiness is and have this idea of once I get this thing then everything will be okay and everything will be all right. And as, as long as we have that idea in our head that, that there's this destination, this ultimate destination that will take care of every, all of our problems and take away all of our problems, as long as we have that idea in our head, we're still going to suffer. And that's, that's what's got me uh, with Buddhism is that, uh, is in discovering that the path is the destination. Walking the path, going to work every day, uh, each, each action that I do is, is part of the destination, it's not separate from it. Um, and it really, I wanted this to be more of a group discussion. I was Kind of, kind of hoping for a wireless mic so I can walk up and down and talk to people and stuff like that. But uh, I, uh, I do want to open up to any questions because I want this to be a little bit more of a group discussion. Um, if anybody has questions about anything that I've said or my experiences or practice or anything, um, please. A couple of things that came to my mind, small as it is. Um, the lessons that there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who write their anger in stone, you all know this, sand and water. I'm at the sand stage now, I'm working toward water, and one of the ways I can do this is, is when somebody, I live in Maine, worst drivers on the planet. You think Vietnam is bad with all the little bikes? Imagine that with SUVs, okay? What I've done now is when they cut me off, rather than chase them down and beat them. <laughs> now I just say to myself, they may have been coming from their, mo their mother's funeral. Maybe going to the doctors to get bad news. As a matter of so that's That helps me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, actually, I'm going to put down the mic and walk around a little bit. <laughs> OK. Young people. Everyone in college, raise their hand. <laughs> it's okay. Did you just graduate? Okay. All right. I would like someone who is in college right now to ask me a question. Why not? For example, if you have a really bad day in college, what do you think is 
the best way to deal with it. I understand. I understand. Well, you know, and I'd say it depends on each individual. Uh, I do know that pretty much every college has resources. They have people that you can talk to. And I think it's okay to know that, that the, the years 18 to 24 are usually the hardest years of anybody's life. And that I have not met any person who's gone through college without having that day and that time um, when those sort of things happen. Um, I can, I can yes. answer that. Okay. <laughs> I'm in college right now as well. I go through a lot of volatile friendships and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. There's people out there that's going to make you angry and there's situations out there that's going to make you angry. The biggest thing that you need to find is your self-awareness and being able to handle that situation yourself rather than depending on other people to, you know, dictate your emotions or anything that happens in your life. So I found it very helpful to the whole present moment thing. It's really, really good. You just, <laughs> Definitely. You, you just yeah. return and you're like, okay, I'm angry. This happened, but this is just one moment in life and we're going to get past this kind of thing. You become self-aware about yourself. What you do, you'll be able to reach out a lot more within yourself and to others, the relationship with others, so that mm -hmm. you'll be able to be able to be successful by communicating with people and help, letting them help you so you can help them. Very good. A man and man, and you apply the technique of mindfulness into your daily life. Because uh, this is confidentiality. Right. Could you please share with us some of the challenging moments in your life? a difficult story between you and your wife and how you use the technique of mindfulness and proficiency. Okay, okay, definitely. <laughs> you know, with, with any sort of marriage or any kind of relationship, people are different. Even people who have things in common are going to have different personalities. Even people with similar personalities are going to have layers of personalities. And, and for me, I think, uh, um, you know, if my, if my wife and I are having a bad day, um, I remind myself, in the same way that I remind myself if we're having a good day, that this was going to pass. And, and when I remind myself of that, the appreciation for that moment really happens. Because I, when, I, when I'm in a good moment with my wife and my son and everything's going great, um, I just remember, oh, this is a precious moment. You know, I, I don't let it slip through my fingers. And, and when there's somebody, whenever there's chaos going on, I remind myself, okay, eventually this is going to stop too. And, uh, as far as a personal story I could think of, uh, uh, you know, my wife has lost a lot of people in her life. She's lost a lot of family members. Uh, uh, she's the, the youngest of six. Uh, of those six, there's only one other sibling alive still. Um, she's lost uh, both of her parents. Uh, so, so both of her, her experience uh, in life has been a lot different than mine. You know, when, when she does get angry or frustrated, I think of my, my own life, and I think, you know, I had wonderful parents, I had a great family, I have a sister who's still alive, uh, I'm happy in my job. Um, and so I, I understand that suffering, suffering doesn't just materialize out of nothing. Suffering comes from somewhere. It's all part of us. You know, and it's a part of my wife, and it's a part of me. Um, but there's different levels. And, and so if we're having a bad day, and I find myself feeling frustrated, I realize, you know, I'm coming from a different place. I'm not, the, I'm not, I'm not seeing the same side of the coin as she is, you know. And I think that's important to know, um, just in general, when, whenever we're interacting with people. You know, we can imagine the pain that they're going through, but the only way to fully know that pain is to live their life. And, and since we can't do that, we have to realize that there may be pain there that we don't see. And, and that uh, and, and, and I think meditation in general, it helps with that because it, it, it helps you realize where your own pain is coming from. You know, if, if you think about your thoughts, you know, there, there's, when we think about meditation in the present moment, whenever we're having a memory, that memory is happening in the present moment. Whenever we're visualizing our future, that, that visualization is happening in the present moment. So, so when we focus on the present moment, it helps us understand the relationship past, present, future in that present moment. So you, you start to feel, if, if you have a memory from the past, 
it's not to throw that memory away, but it gives you insight into, okay, this is what the meaning of that memory was. This is how it impacted me. This is how it brought me here. And the same thing with our future planning. You know, when we look at our future planning and we focus on how that's materializing in our head, it helps us because we see, okay, that's where that planning is coming from. Why do I want to have everything aligned just, just so it's because I'm afraid or it's because I'm scared? And so I think that's what, what, what helps me the most in, in, with practice. And, and, and I, I love my wife a lot, but she's not a Buddhist. But that's okay. And that's all right. But I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Yeah. Where technology is driving us a lot of times, where we send emails, we send texts, and sometimes the words that we use, um, sometimes it comes across very differently on the other side. Especially, let's say we're receiving an email that is not well worded, very nasty maybe in some ways, in the way they say things, or or pleasant would be good, right? But let's say it's not, we take it negatively, right? So we, I mean for myself, sometimes I just react and I'm like. I'm going to write a bad email back, right? But can you help us to really um, share the process as far as how should we receive that email or that text or whatever that setting is, right? And respond back in a way that we feel happier afterwards. And I think that's a great question. I, and I definitely feel your pain on that because <laughs> I, I work in an office where we have, we have 3,000 students enrolled in the College of Engineering a total of 4,000 engineering majors at LSU. And so we get flooded with emails all the time, all the time. And, and it, is, it is very difficult when you get that email where the person is just being so accusatory and vile and, and wanting a response right away. And, I, and, and I've had that urge before to just rattle off like, you know what you can really do? <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that's where I think the, the practice has helped me so much with that because when, whenever anybody does something and they're angry, they are one, it's almost like they want a mirror. They, they want a, that reflection back, right back at them. They're not wanting... If they want resolution, they're not aware that that's what they want. They want that mirror right in front of them. And, and, and choosing not to be that mirror and reflect it back to them, it, 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 it can help diffuse those processes. Uh, I've, I've had parents uh, of students who are maybe failing their classes where they have just decided, you know what, it is everyone but my student's fault and I'm going to write this massive email. I'm going to CC the chancellor, I'm going to CC the dean. I'm going to CC uh, the whole faculty, and that, and uh, there are moments where I really want to respond, and I think it comes back to that relationship of anger knocking on the door versus kicking it in. Uh, when when we first start, anger is still kicking in our door, so when we see those words, it's like, boom, here comes anger. Okay, buddy, you're going to write this email back, and you're going to tell this lady and this guy exactly what you think. Where the, the practice helps is that it, it sets up that buffer beforehand. It sets up that relationship, that understanding with that anger. So that eventually over time, instead of it kicking in, it's, it's knocking. Still a loud knock, still saying, okay, let's just write this email and get it out there. But it becomes more of a conversation and not, not being hijacked. If you think about the word nightmare, a nightmare is literally a night horse. It's a horse that you're on, and the horse is just going, and you have no control over it. And, and this is what our mind does every day. Uh, and that's why we need to practice, because our, our, our mind, if without the practice, it will be a nightmare. It'll be that horse that we're riding, and the horse is just taking us wherever we want to go. And, and, and the, the practice is reining in that horse learning how to use the pulls and the, and, and the words and the compassion. You know, if you, if you, if you kick a horse, that horse is going to take off. You know, if you're dental with the horse, if you feed the horse right, if, if you're compassionate with that horse, then, then there's a relationship there. It trusts you. 
our minds don't trust us half the time. Has anyone, how many people ever experienced self-doubt? Come on. It's okay. Self-doubt. I experience it all the time. And that, you know, I think the, the best way to, with the, going back to the email, the best way is to have practiced beforehand. A lot of times I'll find myself where I think, oh, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to skip my practice this week and I'm just going to go about. And, and, but then what happens is, uh, just like Noah said, everything's impermanent. If you think about a star athlete, you know, you think about an Olympic boxer, okay? You see them when they haven't trained 20 years and they're like 300 pounds and they, you know, they can barely walk and you wonder what happened to that person. That's the same thing with our mind, same thing with our practice. You know, if we let it go, then when that email comes in, it becomes much, much harder. I hear one thing and they've said another. And it's a perception thing where I find that um, my history or my relationships skew my mind to, to hear or, or feel or see something else. How do you use mindfulness to, I don't want to say correct perception, but I already know when I look back at it, my perception was very skewed due to this experience and that experience, even though it is an automatic reaction just from, from life. No, I, I, I really appreciate that question. I, you know, I think who we, who we are, where, where we are right now has all been brought to us from our experiences, from our experiences with our families, from our loved ones, from our partners. Um, and and it, it hurts when we've experienced a bad relationship and there's a dynamic there and a mistrust and, and, and sometimes just downright bad things going on uh, to when you enter into another relationship. It's almost like our mind has created this defense, like, I never want to be hurt like that again. And rightfully so, because nobody wants to be hurt. Nobody wants pain. Nobody wants suffering. And I wish there was an easy answer to that because I, I have yet to find it. Because I, I think it's great that you're aware that those things are happening. And I've seen where that is act in and of itself helps with relationships. Uh, you know, not to name, I, I don't, I, I'm just, I work with clients at the Grief Center and I work with people from a bunch of backgrounds. I actually have a client uh, who has, has had a series of, of abusive relationships in their life. Uh, going back in their in their early childhood, uh, and then going on later on into long-term relationships, uh, and a lot of bad things were done to them. And and one of the things that that really they have struggled with is forming new relationships without bringing all that pain, all that suffering, and those reactions from the old relationship in. And and where I think uh, counseling and meditation helps people. Is that, is that it allows them to look at that situation with that compassionate awareness. They're able to forgive themselves and look at themselves with compassion. They can look at themselves 10 years ago and say, you know what, it's not my fault that this happened to me. And I'm okay with who this person was. And, and I'm here now and I, I love this person. And I, there's not that regret and hate and shame that gets carried in to relationships. And I, and I think emotions in general, you know, that, that's something that I think oftentimes gets, gets missed uh, in counseling and also in meditation practice, is that, is that people believe that their goal is to wipe out certain emotions. And, and those emotions are a reflection of what we've experienced. They, they tell us things about, was this comfortable for me? Did I, did I feel connected with this person? Was that person wrong for me? You know, and there's nothing wrong with feeling those emotions. Um, and, and going back to your question, I really don't, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate in that I've had good relationships. I have had some bad relationships, but um, I think each individual has to find their medicine in their practice. And that's the wonder, I think, of Buddhism, is that it allows you to find that, that you know, that bodhicitta, that seed inside yourself, because ultimately, it's that seed that's going to grow. It's not, nobody can plant that in you. It's already there. You know, somebody can nourish it. Someone can point it out to you. But ultimately, 
it's the practice, it's what you do in your everyday life that brings that. Um, and, and, and there's no guarantee that the pain will end because just like everything else, all the pain is impermanent. Pain has a way of jumping right back in. So. Yes? Okay, college student here. Yes. <laughs> advice would you give a student that um, cost, like, cost had to do with like an overwhelming co course load, you know, <laughs> always something hanging over your head, essay due tomorrow, um, constant tests, studying, studying, you, you know, constant anxiety, add to that, you know, ramen every night, <laughs> right? <laughs> coffee, and relationship problems, you know. <laughs> How, you know, what advice would you give, uh, you know, how can mindfulness help a, you know, a student that help constantly deals with these struggles every day for, you know, months on end? You know, you Definitely. Yeah, so. No, I understand. No, and I, I think that's a great question because I see that every day, every day. Yeah. And where mindfulness helps is that you, you are scheduling an appointment with your own existence. Throughout the day, you're being led around by all these things and all these pressures. But what it does is it gives you that point in the circle where you can have, even if it's 20 minutes, even if it's 30 minutes, of, okay, in these 20 minutes, I'm scheduling an appointment with me. I'm not scheduling it for my professor. I'm not scheduling it for my girlfriend. I'm not scheduling it for my mom. I'm not scheduling it for anybody. I'm doing it for me. And, and I think we, we lose ourselves so much in our society. We, we, we get taken around the track so many times that it feels like this is not going to stop. I'm going to keep running. And there's never a point where we feel like I can sit still and just be at peace with where I'm at. And, and I think that's where having those points throughout the week or even throughout the day, having those points, it, it brings it back. And I, and I think we're a good analogy that's been described to me before is, is if you think about someone whose body's been torn apart and brought to all different directions, like they don't feel, they feel like they're being torn apart. And that's what a lot of college students feel like. It's like, okay, my arm's over here writing a paper. And my left arm's over here checking Facebook to make sure my girlfriend's <laughs> not cheating on me. And then my, my, uh, my head's over here trying to study, prepare for this uh, final exam. And then, and then my legs, I don't know where my legs are. And, you know, that's, that is the, and, and what meditation does is it brings that back. It's like, okay, right hand, here you are. Okay, left hand, here you are. Brain, get back here for a second. We need to feel our heart for a second, feel our lungs. Um, and, and while, you know, as we, like to skip, we like to do things in our society. We like doing. Non-doing, it's like, what is non-doing? Can I do non-doing? <laughs> and, and, and so it's when you do that when you take that time and do those 20 minutes 30 minutes you'll start to see changes in the rest of the 24 hours it's just a fraction of the day you know and, and it doesn't happen overnight I'll tell you that much you know if there if the, the 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 final exam will still be there in the morning and there will still be the events going on but the relationship to those events will change because you'll be back into into your heart, into your mind. And you'll find strength there where you didn't realize it was there. Who? All right, paper, rock, scissors. Who's going first? All right, all right. So I'm also a college student. Yes. Um, got a question. Uh, what do you tell your students that like come in and like they're, they like are about to fail a class or something and like, <laughs> They don't know about mindfulness and all that stuff. Like, how do you how do you tell them to deal with that? Well, and, and you, you right? no, <laughs> <laughs> a friend. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I work at a state school, and I I don't bring, you know, I think for me my mindfulness practice helps me in being there for them at that moment. There are a few students who come in who've already expressed to me things like. Uh, interest in certain philosophies or meditation and, and where I would suggest something like that. But in general, just because of where I work and I can't bring up 
I can't, I can't say, you know what? There's a Buddhist temple in town. Go there, meditate. It'll all be good, you know. And not that I would ever do anything quite that simple anyway. But, uh, but I think where the practice helps me is in being there for that person. Um, being able to listen to that person, I, I usually have them come back and follow up with me on a regular basis. Um, but my hands are sort of tied there. And the same thing with the Grief Recovery Center. Um, it's one of those places where it's, it's primarily uh, like uh, Christian, but there's also other religions that are participating. But it's very tailored to each person and where they are. So un unfortunately, you know, I, I try and... The way I see it is compassion. Compassion and awareness are universal. Those are things that don't belong to any tradition because they belong to every tradition. If you look closely enough for it and look at the actual practice versus belief. Um, and so I try my best to, to focus on that, being there for them, listening to them. But unfortunately I can't say, hey, guess what? Te Da Kuang is right around the street. Why don't you go meditate with him? <laughs> But I wouldn't do that anyway because, you know, they, when somebody's in pain, you know, they don't need to be fixed. There's nothing to fix about pain because pain's part of our life, you know, and, and suffering is a part of our life. And I think where a lot of counselors go astray is they want to fix the client. And, it, and it's, it basically is demeaning. It says something's wrong with you, but there's nothing wrong with, you know, if you lose your house and you're sad and you're depressed and you're angry, and, and you you're just don't know what to do with yourself, there's nothing wrong with you. That's what you're supposed to feel when that happens. If you didn't, you wouldn't be a human being. Thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm being a little not bit yet. tangential. But, yeah. not mm -hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not a college student mm -hmm. right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a topic that I'm pretty sure everyone is uh, would be connected to right now. Um, on top of what she's mentioning about the uh, electronics nowadays, on top of what he's saying about stress and stuff nowadays. So nowadays we're, we're so attached to our electronic iPhone, come on, always on it, Facebook, whatever it is, all that. So we, let's say when we're stressed out, we find electronic, Facebook, game, all that as a form of leisure to de-stress, right? right. So, but um, through a few studies and uh, I went to a few training apps, there is a new emerging diagnosis called cyber addiction, which is emerging, which in term is going against what we're laying on mindfulness. So what is your take on that? On Nowadays, the kids, they don't get that point where they want, like, no, why, why, why would I want to sit there and meditate for an hour? What the heck? I can just jump on my phone right now and relax. So right. what is your take on that and how okay. to bring that awareness back to the kids? Okay. Not just the kids, everybody. Right. Yeah, everybody. Well, and, you know, I, th I think people discover meditation sometimes only after they've experienced a great loss or pain and suffering. As much as I think our, our goal in life, if we do ever find a way to help people, is to help open their eyes to it. Um, and I think that's one way that I, with, with, uh, with Facebook and all these other things, you know, I when it comes to addiction and happiness, when, when, we're, when we experience pleasure, our mind does the same thing. It doesn't matter what's causing that pleasure. You know, there's that dopamine reaction. There's things going on that say, oh, you know what, you're happy now. And then it fades away. And, and the thing about Facebook and all this other stuff, and then, of course, I use Facebook, Facebook and all of it, but where I think people people get themselves into trouble is that they, they look for things external to themselves to bring that stability. And whether it's Facebook, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's sex, they look, they, it's almost like they want, it's like, okay, make me happy. <laughs> you, know? you know, it could be the new car. And, and I think knowing that as long as it's an external thing, you know, phones break. Now, of course, we break as human beings, too. But when we break, we're not aware anymore. You know, and, and, uh, well, that's another discussion. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think, I, you know, I think bringing that into that awareness that they are, that that phone is controlling them. 
that you are giving that phone, giving that thing possession over you and saying, okay, you control me. When it's impulsive, when it, I, you know, I've, uh, there's, there's this thing now where uh, people will actually feel vibrations in their pocket because they think they're getting a text. Because yep. they get texts so, so often that they'll actually feel their phone vibrating when it's not a, a text. Anybody and they'll pull. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it becomes, it, it's, it's almost like whatever you bring into your life, you are giving that permission to be a participant. And, and not just any participant, but, but a voting participant. So if you bring anger to your life, you're saying, you know, anger, you have a right to vote on what I'm about to do today. <laughs> and it's the same thing with the, with the phone and pretty much anything um, that's external to us. Uh, even if it's that bully in school, we're giving them permission to vote on what, what we feel and what we think. And, and I think being that role model, you know, as, as youth leaders, I know a lot of you are, are youth leaders, being that role model and being there for them, it really, it really helps out a lot. Yes? So, I, I do charm it. Um, would be nice, uh, because we live in the you know, distracting world with the technology and, uh, you know, things going on. Would, would it be nice if we uh, just do one thing at a time? So, yes. we dedicate one time. One small time for email, doing your one time, you know, when you stuff one, one thing at a time. Definitely. would help you focus on. Right. Like I guess some of my niece, she working on her work, but she checking her email and, you know, instant messages every time. So, so I suggest, you know, we all do one thing at a time. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. I've heard from college students. Now I want to hear with professionals out in the workforce. Anyone who has a job, a wife, a family. Yes. Can we, can we be both? Yes. <laughs> yes. I am a student. Yes. And I'm also a professor. Yes. And I'm also a real person. Yes. At least play one. <laughs> um, what Katie said, what I've found is my students will be angry and I'll get a nasty email. And what I find destroys the anger is I always type back and go, you know, you're right. Yeah, I see your point. You know, can we talk about this? What? Oh, well, I wasn't really angry at you. I was angry at something else or an Oregon. I don't understand why you talked about this today in the lecture. I don't think it's relevant. I go, but you're right. It probably is. What? Well, no, it's not. You're right. Well, what should we talk about? Well, I don't know. Right. <laughs> and the other thing is I get from students and my peers all the time is I'm bored. I'm so bored. I would love to be bored. I can't even imagine what that would be like to be bored. But so many students today because they have all this electronic gizmo, and I'm guilty too. Uh, my nephew got into my Facebook page a few months ago, and I had to create a new one because he wreaked all kinds of havoc. <laughs> that's because he was bored. And so, <laughs> and if, you, if you turn off stuff um, and thought about Right now, you know, uh, the Buddha said there are two days in the year that you can do nothing about yesterday and tomorrow. Worry about today. That's enough. And I see anxiety is from worrying about tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Depression is, what do I do about yesterday? I can't fix it now. Never mind that. It's not important. Um, I put myself out of practice as a psychologist because I taught mindfulness. And once they learn it, I don't need you anymore. So that was it. So you know, I think uh, we can learn a lot from it. Just what you've been saying and just be mindful of our moods and realize that just as we get annoyed at people, others are annoyed. And we just may be the target, but we're not. But we don't have to be the victim. So, that Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or topics? Yes. There's sometimes there's conflicts because if you really want to succeed and climb the corporate ladder and you know climb fast and get to the top fast, sometimes you cannot be too nice. You have to work much harder, work more hours than normal, and you do a lot of stuff that Buddhism kind of encourages us not to. Uh -huh. Right? Buddhism encourages us to enjoy the moment, uh, uh, be happy with what you have, uh, live in the moment. Don't you know? 
where it's like for the future. So I think as professionals, I think sometimes you can, we can get into that conflict where, you know, our Buddhism practice is teaching us to, uh, to just embrace what we have and, and just be happy and, and, and fully be happy what we have in the moment. But yet, if you want to succeed and uh, do well in the society and, and, and in the professions, you have to sometimes, you know, be not so nice. It's usually the ones that are too nice, you don't climb that fast. So I think uh, that's a struggle I think as we as professionals do encounter. So I didn't know if other people who are also professionals, how do you manage? Uh, I think this session is supposed to be interactions. How do you manage? Because I know there's a lot of folks in here who are very successful uh, in, in your professions. And how do you um, find that medium balance? Now, I, I think it's, it's definitely true that, you know, as in our everyday life, we have this idea of what happiness is and this perception of, of what's going to bring us peace and happiness. And, and in our professional lives, it's okay to plan. It's okay to have goals. And what mindfulness does is it teaches us, okay, where is this goal coming from? Where is this plan coming from? Where is it going? What's our intention? You know, what's our understanding of this goal? Uh, there are a lot of successful people who do a lot of good things in this world. And I think whether it's Buddhist meditation or any form of meditation, it, it helps them to see that it's not just about money, power. It's not just about having control and leadership. That it's also about compassion. It's also about awareness. And, and in terms of a, a job, I, I mean, I, I work in an office where uh, we have we have three counselors who work with four thousand students. Okay, so there's about a thousand students. Uh, there's activities to plan. There's all kinds of stuff going on, and and there are moments where you're working with like five or six different departments on campus, and it starts to get a little bit. How should I put this? A little bad, a little bit bad. And I think where the practice helps me helps me focus is is uh, is realizing that at the end of the day that I'm, I'm there to help people and that no matter what the outcome is, that it's gonna be, it's gonna be okay. Even if I, if I don't succeed this one time, I, I can regroup, I can recover. I um, spoke about Buddhism and how uh, we might confuse it about, you know, Buddhism teaches us to limit ourselves and sometimes that might be like misinterpreted as to you know, we don't have any goals, and we want to strive to reach our uh, <coughs> max potential. So, I think it's important that you know, I think through mindfulness, through awareness, that it allows us, it gives us the, the energy and the wisdom to see uh, between that. If if you want to strive to basically uh, reach the corporate like climb the corporate ladder, uh, reach a certain uh, uh, level, but you know, and but behind that, it's all based on greed. It's all based on being like, oh. I want to reach that level because I want people to respect me. I want to have more money so I can, you know, splurge and stuff like that. Then, yeah, that's something that Buddhism teaches us to live on ourselves sometimes. But if you want to become a doctor, if you want to become, you know, the head of a nonprofit organization to do better, to help others and stuff like that, I think there's nothing wrong with that. So um, the fine line is, is something that is hard to find within each individual, but then through practice, through mindfulness, I think each individual would see that more clearly that you know what your, uh, where the limit is and where the middle path is. I just want to share some, uh, some thoughts about uh, working professionally. Um, when we uh, go on the job for a long time, you realize that the people you work with is not the one you, you can select, right? So <laughs> better than mine. And everyone is uh, come from all walks of life, and they have uh, what we call, if you look at ourselves, a hidden, a hidden assumption about Everything. Right? So every time you get upset uh, by some maybe emails, talking, or whatever action, I think you realize because your assumption about life, about the way things should be, is uh, is is a surprise because the other person doesn't think the same way. Um, and you have a lot of both because again, you not able. Even your family, you can just you know like. You can uh, you can have children, but you don't select the personality 100%. Right? So um, what I found Buddhism that may help us a little bit is the the practice of being patient. 
thinking uh, yeah. Yeah, nice. that doesn't mean that we are withdraw and be surrender to anything but from my experience almost your reaction to any surprising like that immediately you, you will have regret because what happened is you not have enough time to reflect on what really the the other person intention not only that the other person situation right and when you have that moment of you know relax wait a minute uh, I think you come to some understanding and and easy to accept perhaps the intention for the other person is not really meaning to hurt you but just the way he's raised up the situation he was in uh, he may have a good intention as well but just a mis big miscommunication so um, I don't know, I, I, you know, in Buddhism we practice a lot, but patience is one of the things that we should really practice in the communication department. Great, okay, thank you. And definitely, I think, uh, yes? Um, it's kind of a different, kind of going out of the professional topic. Hmm. Um, I feel like a lot of my pain in the past couple of years has been due to me not being mindful and I kind of learned my lesson from that um, which is why you know I keep wanting to go to these retreats or keep wanting to study more about Buddhism and to be mindful but now I feel like um, my current problems is as a result of me kind of turning it up a bit too high too many notches I'm being too mindful now to where I'm noticing, you know, every little bit of my pain as well as everyone around me. Uh, you know, recently, like my youth group went through this really horrible event, and I haven't really gotten over it. And um, and what I aspire to be a doctor, so I want to help people um, sometimes more than myself. And I feel like one of my biggest problems is that I feel other people's pain. But, um, sorry. It's okay. uh, I feel other people's pain, but I don't, I'm not at that point yet where I'm able to help them. And I feel like, you know, I'm being too mindful of things going on around me, but I'm not able to fix it. And that kind of adds on top of it. Um, so I was wondering. You know, the topic is about pursuit of happiness, and I feel like my happiness will come out of being able to help people. You know, that's my ultimate goal in life. Um, but I'm still at this in-between stage. You know, I'm in medical school, just finished my first year, and I don't really know exactly how I'm supposed to help people. You know, I'm just at this point where I see pain, I feel pain, I feel other people's pain as well as myself and I can't stop it, or, and I can't fix it either. So I don't know if you have any advice for me or anybody else in this information on how we kind of tone it down a little bit. Yeah, and I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about everything that's been going on with your youth group and, and, and things, and I, and, I, and I definitely see where you're coming from. You know, I. As a professional counselor, one of the things that got me into my career was was empathy, feeling other people's pain, and and wanting to help people. and And it is is very it's very difficult. It's very difficult. And and when you see people who are in extreme pain and you feel that pain, uh, you want to do everything that you can to help that person. And sometimes it can it can be very overwhelming, especially if you're a very compassionate person and care about people. And, and, and the feeling of powerlessness, I think, is ultimately what really makes it hurt, is seeing people in pain and being, pow being powerless. Um, and where I think your, com your compassion and your understanding, your compassion especially, and being there for them in that pain um, is really going to help people long term is being with there with them with compassion uh, my wife works in a, in a hospital and she she you she can go on and on about doctors who just don't care They're, they got in for the money and they didn't care about their patients and and, and I, as a as a medical student I can tell that you're probably under a lot of stress 
actually is pretty much 100% guaranteed that you're under a lot of stress. <laughs> and it's probably guaranteed that you've seen a lot of things. And, and it's very difficult to see that kind of pain on a daily basis and still not bring that home and to feel it as you, as you go home. And, and, and that was, I think that ultimately that was what, what, what got me into meditation practice. Uh, I had known about it in theory before and, and I, had, I had studied it, but it, uh, what actually got me into practice was uh, I was working at a, uh, at a clinic, a methadone clinic, uh, doing substance abuse counseling. Um, and, and the people would come in and they would be in just terrible pain and nothing would stop the pain. And they would come in with all these horrible stories and, and just in the, just horrible relationships and, and witnessing that every day. Um, especially being somebody who cares about people, you know, it started to wear on me. It started to make me feel like, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't go home. It's almost like, you know, they say not to bring your clients home, but mentally speaking, they would come home, you know, they would be in my bed with me because I couldn't sleep because I could think about their suffering and their pain. And, and awareness and compassion, there's a balance with meditation. Compassion is wonderful. Compassion is great. Compassion is the ultimate goal. Awareness is knowing that if there's nothing I can do to help this person right now, that the best thing I can do for both of us is to try and find some peace. And, and knowing that, that ultimately down the road there's a chance that they'll find peace. And, and it's okay not to know how to fix things. You're still a student, you're still learning, you know, I'm still learning, we're all still learning. And, and I, I could f definitely feel your pain, you know, I could tell that you, you know, it's really hard for you to be in those situations. And, 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 and something that's helped me too as a counselor is, you know, what we've been recommended in our program is that we go undergo counseling ourselves. Because if we're going to be there for somebody else's pain, we have to look at our pain. And that, that secondary trauma, that's... That's something that, uh, that a lot of people aren't aware of. It's like when you get into a helping profession, there's this thing called secondary trauma. There's the trauma of the actual suffering of the person, and then there's the trauma of the people treating that suffering. So the, so the firefighters who rush in to save the bomb victim, or the people who go in to help the victims of the tornado, and they see the pain. You know, there's that secondary pain. And, the, and, and I think it's good, it's good that you're aware of it. It's good that you're willing to talk about it. Um, and I think it's uh, finding those resources in your, in your community where you, where you can find help for your pain also. That's the same thing was he was saying, but just mostly my experience. Actually, I feel for you exactly my whole life, you know, trying to help people. And then I'm in the mental health field, so I'm also a therapist. So going through it's severe, most of them are the severe ones. So every day you hear just loads and loads of suffering. And you can't really help them most of the time. The max you can do is trying to alleviate their pain at that moment. So you know, going home, trying to let that go is hard. But you try to find it through retreat, go to read books, do this, do that, Facebook, the iPhone. All those things truly does not help truly. The only thing I found is through everything what Buddha all the Zen master, all the teacher have been saying over and over and over. Just practice. Sit, just like Noah just said today. Sit, find, and as the only thing that truly helps me, set up a routine for you to sit. I go to a meditation center every twi twice a week. I try to, before I go in to see my patient, I will sit before I do that. That is the only way to save yourself. So even though it's great to hear it, me, all my, I'm saying this might be BS for you if you do not find it and find your practice and just do it, seriously. So I feel for you. will happen even if you are done with all the studies and um, you are well out practice because you cannot fix everything. So it will happen again. The most important thing that I, uh, I find is that am I really trying hard enough for the patient? Uh, do I have the compassion for the patient? And um, if I do have those ingredients, if I have tried the best that I could, and if I um, put all my compassion for my patient, 
and that's what most important because we cannot be defeated by all the pain and the suffering. Uh, because yes, I do feel the pain as well, but at the end of the day, if I know that, yes, all I went into work with all my heart, and I try all the best, all the best intention for the patient, at the end of the day, I have to look at it and smile. But um, because in when you go out and work, you know, patient die. I see patients die all the time. Uh, and some of the patients I've seen for uh, many years, and some of the patients are very nice. Um, I, I have to treat every uh, patient the same way, but you know, the, some of the patients that you uh, are attached to some way, somehow, and when they die, it, it's painful. However, you just have to know that you know, that's uh, how impermanence works. You have to use Buddhism in uh, in your everyday, including the practice. And um, so, uh, again, the most important thing is that if I try hard enough, well, it's never enough. But if I try the best and have the uh, uh, the compassionate heart uh, towards every single one, at the end end of the day, I have to accept it as the best effort and move on. That's the only way that you will survive in the future, and and uh, I found that's the only way that I, I could move forward after after losing some of the patients that I got really attached to. And so some days I have a sad face because of the news of some of the patients that just passed away. But uh, you know I would go back on what I've done for the patient. If anything that I could improve, I would. If uh, Nothing that I could improve, then I just smile and go on. I have to meet that and move on. Happiness thoughts, sad thoughts, painful thoughts, and openly talking about it so that we all can understand it and we all can embrace it and we all can accept it so that we can move forward in this mindfulness stage that we're trying to acquire, trying to build for ourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. With you guys the next couple of days. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> so now we all understand how his, uh, his daily job is, right? So he'd come and ask people for their problems and they listen to them. And he, but he'd not take it home. So that's a big, big message that we have to, uh, to learn from him that he can uh, deal with our problem, ask them that right there at the moment and leave it there. Don't take it home. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, thanks again. Uh, Thank you.